Welcome to your weekly UAS news update. And this is week 70. And this week we've got a few topics. I got four of them. The first one is going to be actually three different topics in one, but uh, drone pilots have been misbehaving a little bit this week, or at least it was a little bit more in the news, unfortunately. So we'll talk about that. I want to talk about a discussion from the FAA administrator Dixon. He talks about remote ID and a bunch of the other things, and I, I want to give you an update on that. Uh, I want to talk about type certification for UAS that are coming, and that's kind of related to what the FAA administrator was talking about. And then lastly, a good update from DJI. They finally have support for the smart controller and the Mavic Air 2, so I'll talk about that as well. So let's get started. So the first thing this week is three different stories where we have drone pilots doing, well, stupid things. And this is not helping our case, unfortunately, especially as the FAA is about to release Remote ID, and which I'm sure is going to be controversial, but we're just giving them ammo at this stage to basically say, see, told you, we need to really put this in place. So uh, the first one was a helicopter pilot that actually got to catch a Mavic Mini. Now, this is a Aeromed helicopter. This was in Grand Rapids. They were landing on top of a hospital and uh, realized that there was a drone in the area, so they kind of paused for a second and eventually landed. And you can see on the video that, that's playing right now in the background, this is just a bizarre video, you can see the crew just starting to walk and walk and walk. And then as it switches to the other video, you can see the drone hovering really, really close to the pilot. I don't know what they were thinking, quite frankly, but eventually it gets close enough that the pilot just swats at it and is able to catch it. So they're able to recover. It's a Mavic Mini. Uh, unfortunately, as you know, the Mavic Mini 249 grams does not require um, registration with the FAA, so it's unlikely they'll be able to find out who it is, unless I think if they buy it from DJI directly, then DJI has the ability to uh, find the, the parts number and then eventually catch the uh, whoever did this. Just plain dumb, I'm sorry. There's just nothing else to say about this. Please, please, please be respectful of other aircraft, especially when they're landing on top of a hospital. The next thing was a drone that stopped wildfire operations, and this was near the Bobcat fire near LA, and it caused the entire fleet of firefighting airplanes to stop flying. And as you know, and I know I don't have to tell you guys, because you're watching this, obviously you're responsible, but uh, please, please, please do not fly around wildfires. If you do, they can't fly. It's really that simple. And then the last one was, and I'm sure you've seen it in the news, it was in a lot of different places, a drone that landed during a baseball game. This happened in Chicago as well. There's got to be something in the water in, uh, in that area. <laughs> That's two of them so far uh, this week. Uh, th that was a Mavic Pro, the original Mavic Pro that landed during a game in Chicago and causing delays. You can see the drone basically coming down. And uh, he has a, a GoPro on top of it. Now, I, I've, I read a whole bunch of uh, people saying, why would you put a GoPro on top of it? My guess was that they knew exactly what they were doing, that they were going to land there. And they wanted to have the camera on the drone pointing down so that they could see what was going on down so they could land there. And then they had the GoPro on top so they could actually record the footage of the drone going down. Again, just plain stupid. Um, the one thing that surprises me actually is no one with a, a ball was able to just basically hit that thing. Now, I know you're not allowed to take down an aircraft. This is still considered an aircraft, not supposed to take it down, but you know what? The FAA should make exceptions in this case. This is the, f I think the fourth or the fifth one that we've seen at a baseball game now. And uh, there should be a reward for the players. Just practice your pitch, just take down this damn thing. And then uh, maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but anyways, it's uh, just kind of annoying to, to see that this is giving the entire community just a bad reputation. Now, um, that's it. That's all I'm going to talk about. Please don't be that person. Or if you do, don't tell them you know me, right? The next discussion was the FAA administrator talking about remote ID and a bunch of other things. Uh, he made a speech at the beginning of the UAI, uh, UAS Expo, and um, he talks about a few points. The first one that I, I thought was interesting, he says that they expect by 2024 to have 800,000 registered commercial drones. Now, I read a document not too long ago called CONOPS, Concept of Operation for UTM. And uh, by the way, really good document if you're interested in knowing more about UTM. But CONOPS has numbers that are much higher predicted by 2023. So they actually uh, lowered their number in terms of number of registered drones by 2024. But that's just a side note. Uh, something else that he said that I thought was really interesting is he said, 
said, if you operate a drone, you're a pilot, just like I am. And this makes me giggle a little bit because you have uh, all over forms, you have people that are um, insecure, I'm going to call them, that are pilots, many aircraft pilots, I'm a many aircraft pilot, and I'd love to diminish drone pilots when uh, when they say that they're pilots. Now, the FA obviously has this term, remote pilot, and it again, it makes me kind of uh, kind of laugh that I see this. Um, coming straight from the operator, if you operate a drone, you're a pilot, just like I am. That's a direct quote. Uh, the other thing that he said, not so much fun, he said, We're working to establish a remote ID requirement so that drones will provide identification and location information that can be received by the FAA, law enforcement, and anyone with a smartphone. Now, this is something that when the NPRM came out, a lot of us uh, mentioned, and uh, if you've been following me for a while, you know I wrote this very long uh, blog post that, that explained 16 different things that uh, were really wrong with the NPRM. And one of them was obviously the fact that uh, the, the public, the general public, would be able to find where the operator is located. And um, this is not good. Now, the fact that they can find if there's a drone flying is, I guess, on the edge of maybe okay. The fact that they can't find where the operator is located is not going to be good because uh, because it's going to lead to issues with people going there and, and saying, why are you flying over my house? Why are you flying over this? Why are you not allowed to fly here? And we see a lot of these already, but now that people can find out exactly where the drone is located and follow it all the way to the pilot, then, uh, then we're going to have an issue. So um, no, no kudos to the FA for this. I think this is going to create a lot of issues uh, everywhere, but we'll see. Um, he also re reiterated that flying over people, flying at night, is going to become a routine operation. I've mentioned this in the past. There is a, an NPRM that came out a while back, and they're finally going to release the final ruling around the same time, I think, as they will for remote ID. And, uh, and he also said something that I found interesting, that they're revisiting the NOTAM system. And oh my god, finally, somebody is looking into the damn NOTAM system. This has been, the NOTAM system, if, you don't, if you're not familiar, NOTAM is Notices to Airmen. And this is a way that the FAA can provide information to pilots. This is manned aircraft pilots and unmanned pilots. And, and it has been a mess for years and years. And, and the reason I'm saying it's a mess is because there's just an overload of information. Go to any large airport around the country and pull the list of NOTAMs and you'll see that it's just a maze that you would spend hours and hours just trying to read through all this information. And not only that, but the, the way that NOTAMs are written is just unless you're trained to do it, which which I am and some of you are if you've if you've done my course, but even then it is just Overwhelming. That's the that's the word. So he said they're working on a single data source in order to simplify NOTAMs, and I really hope that they find something that makes a lot more sense than what we have right now. And this this has been overdue for uh, over a decade, quite frankly. So I'm going to put a link down here. You can see the video from uh, his presentation. I I think not really a big surprise, quite frankly, from everything that he said in there. But uh, just thought that I would mention all these things now. The, to, to tie this into what the administrator just talked about, we have the FA that released something saying that type certification for UAS is coming. Now, type certification, let's go back for a little bit and let me explain what, what this term actually means in the manned aircraft world. When you have Piper, Cessna, Airbus, anyone that's trying to make an airplane, they're going to go to the FA and they're going to provide the FA with information about the aircraft. I'm going to say, well, we're going to, the aircraft is going to be this big, it's going to have this many fuel tanks, it's going to have this kind of landing gear, it's going to have all this kind of equipment on board of the airplane. And then the FAA is going to look at it and it's going to say, okay, boom, you're good to go, you can start producing this aircraft uh, mass production. And uh, but, but, the caveat is when you buy one of these airplanes, you have to maintain the uh, the, the same equipment that is on board of the aircraft because it was certified to fly with this specific type of thing. Um, I'll give you an example. When I was a flight school manager, we had uh, I sold an aircraft and I sold a Cessna 172 to somebody who lived in um, in the Middle East of um, 
uh, in, in the Middle East. And um, he wanted to fly the airplane from the US all the way to Europe, from the Europe to the Middle East. And the only way that he could do this is by having external fuel tanks added to his aircraft. So he went, he flew from, I was in Arizona at the time, he flew in Arizona, he flew to um, California. In California, they installed uh, tanks, additional tanks underneath the wings so that he could have extra fuel so he could fly from here all the way to the northern part of the country and then cr cut across and then eventually get to Europe. So uh, in order to do, the, the whole reason I'm saying this is because in order to do this, it, this was not designed for the type certification of the aircraft. The Cessna 172, when it comes out of the factory, is not designed to have external fuel tanks. So he had to get special approval, okay? It's called an STC, Supplemental Type Certificate. But uh, supplemental, right, type certificate, an additional uh, approval in order to make sure that everything was good in here. Now, the the reason I'm saying all this is because this philosophy of having a type certificate is coming to the UAS world. Now, not all of them, not all the UAS at the moment, from what I understand. But what the FAA has been reluctant to do is approve UAS to fly over people, to fly at night, to fly beyond visual line of sight because they don't have a type certificate. Because anybody can create a drone, really, and, um, and the reliability of it depends really on the type of manufacturer, okay? So now there's going to be criteria, there's going to be standards that the FAA is going to look into and say, this aircraft is type certified to do this kind of operation. When that happens, the FAA is all of a sudden more comfortable saying, well, this aircraft has been reviewed. There is a specific set of items that have to be on board the aircraft. I don't know all the details just yet. Quite frankly, I haven't read the actual document from the FAA, but uh, from discussions that I've heard before at different conferences, this is the way I understand it's going to work. So. Um, Obviously, we have uh, probably a, a scheduled maintenance is going to have to be done on these aircraft. So it's going to be a little bit more strict than what we have seen before. And this is kind of, it, it seems like it's not something that many people have been talking about, but it is a big part of the puzzle to make a lot of these complex operations way more routine. So, uh, so type certification is coming to UAS. You will in the future be able to buy a UAS that has been type certified, which I'm sure is going to cost a lot more money. And, um, and then you're going to have to follow probably certain uh, steps in order to fly that aircraft, but it will be easier with that kind of aircraft to basically be approved to do these uh, complex operations at the moment, which by then will be routine. Hope this makes sense. The last piece of good news is that DJI finally came up with the uh, support for the smart controller with the Mavic Air 2. Uh, they promised it for a long time, ever since the Mavic Air 2 came out. And, uh, and, and I have a smart controller and I have a Mavic Air 2. You know, I have a course where I teach you how to use the Mavic Air 2. And, and I'm excited about this because, uh, because I, I love the smart controller, quite frankly, and I've been using it with other drones. And then now I can just bring one controller and have the ability to control several drones. So uh, no more of actually, I have it right here. I'm about ready to do, uh, to do a little uh, tutorial on how to use the smart controller with it. So uh, I'll have a video. The video will be in our free course. We call it the Deep Dive Mavic Air 2 course. Uh, I show you, it's three hours of free video. This is a free course. Uh, I show you how to get started with the drone, what the drone can do, all the different functionalities. And, uh, and we're providing this for free because we believe that uh, this is a great way for you to be safer flying out there. And, uh, and, and we want you to be safe just so that you're not in the news, just like I showed you with those uh, first three people, I'm going to call them to be nice. Okay, this is all I have. I will see you guys next week and look out for this video. Uh, if you're not part of the course, the, the Mavic Air 2 course, um, add it right here. And then um, again, it's free. So make sure you join. All right, see you guys next week.